right, no rest for the weary. Um, so Hothaday does the lensing thing in the second half of his video. He just makes an absolute mess out of that. So since that's the more complex thing, I'll go to that after I... I'm just going to go through a quick run-through of what force is and how the universe is applying it to all of us all the time. And um, see if there is some hope of any fairness from these idiots about what I'm saying. All right, so the idea is this: there's this field around us. It's full of these little bits moving the speed of light. Their magnetism, their light, and their gravity. Those are the three easy ones. Inside the atom, you might want to call them something else, but they're doing fundamentally the same thing. And they have two polarizations. That's it. So, yeah, that's all you need to know for now. So that's all there are. The things moving the speed of light, and it can hit you going this way, or it can hit you going this way. And they're hitting you all the time. So just imagine a giant field of random arrows going in random directions, and 99% of them have nothing to do with you, but there is that little 1%, well, it's point zero 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 one percent but whatever, are pointed right at you. And they're going to hit you. No matter where you go, that, that spot is going to get hit. You go to the spot where it's going to get hit. doesn't matter. You can't get away from them. They're constantly hitting you. And because you're next to the earth, the ones coming from underneath aren't hitting you as much. And so the ones hitting you from the top are pushing you into the earth. And the earth is getting pushed into the sun. And the earth is pushed into a sphere by these little arrows that keep hitting it and forcing it to stay clumped together. And what's really clumping, though, are the little atom bits. They're getting hit with it. <laughs> the little electron bits are getting hit with it. The little proton bits are getting hit with it. Everything's getting hit with it. And that's why everything tends to do the little roundy thing. It's because everything is saying it's coming from all directions. All right. So that's why stuff is held together. And at the, the atomic level is where the force is at its rawest. It's most native. It's wildest. And it's basically this is an electron. It's got stuff going this way, and it's got stuff going this way, and stuff this way, and stuff this way, and stuff coming out, and stuff going in. And there's force all the way around it, and it just kind of keeps it in a ball. So it's just like gravity. So the blue arrows are doing that all the time. The blue polarization bounces off. So it hits and reflects, hits and reflects. And when it hits, it changes the direction of the thing it hits. And these little pieces tend to stay in here. All right, they'll switch direction. Well, I'll get to that. But the, you can get the idea. If this tries to get out, it's eventually going to hit arrows hitting it back in. And the, in, randomly, there's going to be some more arrows from one direction at any one moment than another direction. So this little bit will keep wobbling back and forth and back and forth. So the whole thing is shuddering, okay, which might be called browning motion, but I mean, that's what it's doing. It's, it's shuddering because it's getting a little bit random more from one direction than another all the time. All right, so there's these two interactions. <laughs> I'm amazing I didn't draw them here. Um, I, you know, I probably shouldn't have left them out because they're just so fundamental, but I've drawn, you've seen them, the, the X thing and the reflection thing. So I just did the reflection thing here. The blue goes in, it reflects, so a blue leaves, and this blue goes this way. And it's meaningful. I mean, it's an invisible reaction in the sense there's stuff going this way and stuff going that way, but if this thing didn't exist, this stuff would just keep going. So obviously it's quite necessary to the function of keeping this together that these things exist. So they're obviously doing something, even though the net reaction doesn't look like it's anything, it's obviously something. And you can really understand it by just, you know, looking at the moon. It's round for a reason. All right. Um, okay, and so <clears throat> the other reaction that happens to all this stuff, the blue is doing this too, is it can hit something perpendicular inside of here. So something moving this way. And if it's moving this way, what it does is it turns the thing going this way into something going that way. But it's still inside of the thing. And the thing that came in goes out this way. Now, if a blue does that and it's all blue, well, I don't see much. But obviously, if this is an all blue stuff and I hit it with a red arrow and the red arrow goes out perpendicularly, you're going to notice that's a pretty substantial change. Red stuff goes in one way, red stuff comes out another way. That's a change. 
All right, so this is the electron, let's say. This is the blue stuff, just represented by a little bit. And so what happens when a red, so pretend the greens are red, but it doesn't matter. So a green arrow goes in, what happens? Yes, it hits one of the things going perpendicular, makes it go the other direction, and this thing goes the other direction and leaves. So the green leaves perpendicularly, the blue inside is now changed to a blue going a new direction. So the net result is an arrow going that way inside is now an arrow going this way. So now the net reaction is this thing has more force going this way. It also has a tiny bit of force going the opposite way of the arrow it lost, which means that it might tend to go this way in motion. All right, so this is a one, two, three, four kind of thing. So here's two electrons meeting each other. Now, as they get closer together, the blue can't escape. You understand, it's reflections. It's always a reflection. So it reflects and pushes this thing a little bit away, and it pushes this one a little away. So as they bounce back and forth, but the point is a force came in, so a force is stronger than this pressure. And so it pushes them closer together. And as it pushes them closer together, this arrow bounces back and forth more times. So the frequency of impacts increases, which equals to more force in the sense that the force is maximized in the time that it's um, imposed, which makes it a more active uh, in the current present, so to speak. It's a time equation, but I don't want to get in it, because that's what frequency is, a time equation. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So it all has to do with the magnitude of the force that started it and how strong that was. So if this was a, you know, a 50 blues went in, it might, t it might compress this quite a bit before you end up having 50 reactions. So if it was just one ping pong ball going back and forth, going one a second, and 50 worth that came in here, it might take a while before there's 50 worth hitting this wall per second. But once that happens, the force is equalized, and now this force will become stronger than this force, unless this force is continually applied. If it's not continually applied, this force will be the stronger force, and it will push the electron away. <clears throat> but you can sort of understand that this is why electrons really can't be combined, because there's always going to be something in there that's blue, and it's always going to get stronger and stronger as you bring them closer and closer, just like magnets do. So the point is, is that it gets compressed in, and then it, when it leaves, it's going to probably do this thing on the direction. So the one, two, there's more frequency, more pressure, three, it leaves. That's the function of electrons on electron. All right, um, electron proton. So here's the blue thing, here's the green thing. Now the trick here is, is they're not really attracted to each other. They're basically going to be pushed together by the force. But the thing to understand is, is that the blue things trapped between them can escape through the green. They'll go out perpendicular from a green. The green things trapped between them, they'll go out perpendicular from the blue. So nothing gets trapped between them. So no pressure can ever build up between them. Now, while these things are going out, they are, they're adding a little bit of momentum out. But the truth is that little bit is so much weaker than this bit because all of the energy coming in from the outside now is doing the same thing this stuff on the inside did. It's all leaking. The blue energy is leaking out of here, going into the green and leaving. The green energy is going in from here and leaving. So no green can get to the green. No blue from out here can get to the blue. So there's absolutely almost no pressure between these two things because nothing can get in here. And so obviously that creates attraction. So attraction is essentially the absence of the normal repulsion, the, the absence of the pressure maker. No pressure maker, no capacity to resist the external pressure. The external pressure pushes them together. Okay, I, I think somebody who has a, a high school education should have been able to follow this. I think so. I'm saying this This explains all of Maxwell's equations. It, it fundamentally explains most of the um, thermodynamics of atoms and merely figuring out the configurations. This will undo most of what is the current model of the atom. These bits are not swirling around. They're not doing any of the crap. They're magnetic bits and they have positions, uh, ra rather rigid ones, and they have tension in those positions. And what we're seeing is movement is just their tension. Okay. 
But anyway, it's all there. It's, it completely conserves energy and force always kind of stays on the outside of the elemental particles. But it's clearly channeled by the elemental particles. I mean, I could have drawn the fourth drawing, you know, but I, I want to make a separate video for the way the electrons and the protons are channeling, like electrical currents, force. Because then you'll really get it. All right, so anyway, so this is the lensing part. I don't know how this got so fucked up with looking. Where's the lens? I must have erased it. Okay. Well, anyway, <clears throat> so I had made... Well, I'll go to the... I'll just back up because it must be there. All right, so this is the atomic shit, and then he did this lens shit. Okay, so this is the this is the the rather steep curve of gravity's drop-off. And I made the argument that what it really produces is this kind of a lens. Okay, so my argument was is that you have to respect what R squared means, which is this is the lens. So instead of the lens going like this, which would be an R lens, okay, it's doing the R squared lens, which is this. So this is what R squared gravity looks like. And this is what R gravity. <laughs> okay, so a, a regular convex lens is, is, is a lens that's doing R parabola. And for this equation, you have to do an R squared parabola. So let's understand, that's the last we want to mention lenses. It's not my fault they called this gravitational lensing because lenses do something fundamentally different. They don't bend light, they diffract light. So the thing is, is that the thin part of the lens, you know, in, in a real equation, the thin part of the lens is actually bending the light more than the fat part of the lens. So the idea is, is light comes in from distant places and it gets diffracted more down and less, 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 and then straight line here in the middle. So the thickest part is the straightest part. That's what a regular lens is doing. So in a sense, it's exactly opposite of what gravity is doing. Because gravity is getting weaker. So this is the planet. So you can sort of understand gravity is getting preposterously weaker out here and is bending less, not more. So there's no way to have a focus out here. Because as it's bending less, this light's going to go off this way. <laughs> well, it's going to go off less bent, so that's being unfair. But this is hundreds of light years across. So you can just understand, if it bends it a little, all it's going to do is make it go a little bit less straight. So it'll have a tiny kink in it. And then this light will have a little better, less kink. And this light will have even less kink. But there's no opposite effect, where you get more reflection from the outside than there was on the inside. The regular lens, more reflection on the outside than the inside. Gravitational lens, less reflection on the outside, more reflection on the inside. Exactly the opposite of what you want. So the one close to the plant will get highly deflected. <laughs> okay, so it's going to go more like this. So you can see the light gets spread by a true gravity lens. And so I use this illustration because it's just an illustration to point out that this is the kind of lens you'd have to make to duplicate it honestly in terms of saying what is the, the actual part of the lens that's bending light, the, the part that makes the light bend. But Hathaway is correct in the sense that if you could remanufacture the lens, we know that the thin part of the lens diffracts the light more <laughs> and the fat part diffracts it less. Okay, and so you'd end up with a, a focus out here, but obviously that won't work in this circumstance because the light isn't coming straight. So the, the part of the light that's going to the thick part of the lens would be the light that's actually the furthest, has the highest angle. So the simple illustration is, look, if the light's coming from a source, what it needs to have happen is the light out here needs to be bent more than the light coming in here. And that's just not in the math. That's not in gravity. Gravity is doing the opposite. Opposite. This way, if this one bends this much, this one's going to bend just that much or that much. And it's just not going to mean that these beams of light will be collated. And that's the whole point. You're trying to, you're trying to collect little tiny fragments of light. That's what lenses do. Little fragments of light, little pieces of it, and combine them all into one little image is now it's brighter and that won't happen with gravity 
because gravity gets weaker. It, deflect, it deflects the light less the further away the light is from the gravitational body. So it's the opposite of one of the lenses we use. So he did this stupid thing. When he drew the eyeball, I was just ready to go insane. So he does this bullshit. And, and so he's, he's saying it's this kind of, like I said, this part of the lens is right, but it's only right if you obey refraction. And as he drew, it spreads the light. And that's the problem. You, you, spreading it's not going to help you any. So he should have just shut up right there and said, oh, yeah, I'm in trouble. Because it's just going to spread the light. <clears throat> I don't know what this is going to do. I want to get to the eyeball drawing. Yeah, it's right in here somewhere. Okay, so he's still doing, he's, and he's applying equations to completely wrong circumstances. I mean, obviously you can't use gravity equations on quanta because quanta is the force. You can't use the, the, the equation describing a force and apply it to the force. You can't do that. The universe isn't a fractal. I don't know where the eyeball is. It's missing. It's just gone missing. So I guess we'll just have to play along here. This isn't the shape of glass. It's not the shape of um, of how light is bent. It is the shape of how light is bent. So I'm just saying the further away you go, the less bending you get. And to have a lens, you need more bending for the photons with the highest angle. The ones with the... The, the ones most... <coughs> um, what's the word? Um diverging. The ones diverging further away from you are the ones you need to have reflected the most, deflected the most. And they're the ones that are deflected the least in a gravitational lens. So it can't possibly collect the light. It just spreads the light. Gravitational lensing is in fact impossible physically. And they should have figured this out before I had to come along and explain it. Passing through it, yeah, it's just nonsense. Well, again, you say it's nonsense. I say it's fundamental. They got the wrong shape to the lens is fundamental. The wrong understanding of how the fact that lenses are inversely intuitive. The thin part of the lens deflects the light the most. The fat part deflects it the least. That's a fundamental. You have to inverse that for gravity. So... I didn't watch this yet, so I don't know what he's going to say here, but I'm just saying, so he, he's, he's, again, he, if you're going to debunk somebody, just know you're right, and you're not right. And it's just pitiful. The basic way the man goes wrong is to forget that it's his own... In you, you just keep going wrong, and it's, it's just, like a scan, it's just pitiful. I mean, look, this might even, you, you could even say in some other context, okay, he's just going to take on some nutter. I've been doing this arguing thing for 10 years, Hatha Day, and maybe you think that I lose arguments all the time, but I think most people would say that's a delusion you have. I don't usually say something unless I can explain it and defend it. You dumb fuck. And you're going to sit there and be so obnoxious in your challenges, you ought to fucking brain up first. Because this, this is pitifully, disgustingly wrong that you have to keep perverting what I'm saying to make your arguments and then applying formulas that have no business being applied. For a square law where the force is a function of distance. Okay, I saw this part. So this is where the eyeball comes in. So I'll spare you the, the force is a function of distance, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that's fine. The point is, is that lenses aren't bending light. They're diffracting light. And they so so thin glass deflect d d because of the angle it hits the glass it gets deflected more uh, refracted more, um, and that doesn't happen in gravitational lensing. There's less. So again, the thing far out here has has less deflection, and for it to be a lens, there needs to be more. The thing out here is getting deflected less. There needs to be more deflection the further away you are from the body for, for it to work because the thing is coming at a further angle. It's going the wrong way more and it needs to be bent even more to go the right angle. Damn, this is, an, this is really not hard. Every, it will also add the final if it, if it begins its journey only with a velocity in the x-direction, when it 
Especially Look, this shouldn't even be applied to a photon. The, you know, the argument is that the mass equations, again, I, I, I think photons deserve to be called something with a mass of one because they have energy in one direction and they have a, a Planck constant amount of force as individuals. So I don't really mind giving them mass in that sense. But all of these force equations are written about matter. You can't apply them to subatomic particles because they are force. They're the ones using and manipulating force. So you can't apply force to them because they don't behave the same way. And he talks about electrons here going billions of miles through space. I don't think you can make an argument that electrons do that. Electrons have to be pushed constantly. They have to be accelerated. They just don't accept just having velocity. I don't think you can demonstrate electrons being fired anywhere. I don't think they can fire electrons to the moon, bounce them off the moon, and have them come back to, have them come back to Earth. Electrons just won't do that. The galaxy. It will have time. I don't think electrons... <laughs> well, I don't want to get into the whole gravity thing. I don't think electrons are affected. They're, they're, they're not as substantially affected by gravity. Clearly, people don't have this intuition that when a charge builds up on a plate, let's say I have a plate, that there's more charge at the bottom because there's more gravity, so the electrons got pushed down to the bottom. Nobody has the perception, if I have wiring going up, up a 100-story building, that the electricity takes longer to go up the building than it took to go down the building. These things aren't affected by the force the same way, and it's just silly to apply these equations as if they are. They're not. They're interacting with the force directly. In the y direction, and still its velocity in the x. Well, it doesn't have an x and y direction. Again, a photon doesn't have any any perpendicular component, so it's just silly to argue that it has directions in both, that it combines momentums. It doesn't do any of that, and you're just making my argument for me by using that as an explanation for bending. Einstein's bent space doesn't need velocities in different directions because what Einstein's bent space is doing is bending the field it's, it's moving in. And there's the bend. That's all the bend you need. You don't need to do a velocity um, vector addition equation. X direction. And that tiny amount will be the sum of all the, 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 the tiny influences as it spends 200 light years past. Yes, I know. This whole thing is just nonsense, though, because my point is no, there's no math in the universe that will make the photon that goes out here get bent more than the photon that comes in here, or the photon that comes in here, or the photon that comes in here. No matter what happens, this one out here is going to get bent less than the one here, and you need it to be exactly the opposite Oh, sorry. You need it to be exactly the opposite for it to be a lens. It can't work as a lens if if there's not going to be more bending of the ones that need to be bent the most. Seeing that galaxy. Now, this calculation, if you look up the uh, the mass of an electron and the mass of a galaxy, and 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 do the the maths. Uh, All right. So he's applying um, Newton's gravity equation to photons and electrons. And, you know, I'm the one out of bounds. As to the force it's experiencing, it's easy maths. I'm not sure exactly how you do it, but, but it's doable to, um, instead of using mass, you make a, use an alternate, an alternate form. Right, and then you have to figure out what the time equation is, because obviously it's amount of time in certain amounts of gravity so then you have to put in the speed of light thing and then you're really going to be in trouble buddy but i'm just saying there's look there's no way to rationally get around the simple argument the photon that arrives in in the least amount of gravity has no hope of being bent more it has no hope of it and it has to be for it to get here it has to be so uh, you know, fuck you in this bullshit argument. The photon further out in the gravity has no hope of being bent more. Where you just use momentum. Thus, light has a momentum even though it has no mass. And we're talking about each individual photon's momentum is the same, so that part of the equation is moot. 
the photon further out it will get bent less now the game is over there's no lens but there's an equivalent formula you can use for light and it too experiences a deflection an effective period where it's acted upon and it points down at some angle uh, right, and some angle that doesn't get bigger as you go further away from the center. It has to get bigger for it to be a lens, a useful lens, something that isn't spreading light. Well, it's not going to spread it, but it's just not going to make it. There's not. Go it's not going to. <laughs> it's not going to be able to. It's not going to have. A, it's not going to. It's going to deflect it less than the divergence it arrived at. So it's not even going to overcome the divergence. That it's past the galaxy. Now, this is 200 light years, remember? If you are. Yeah, right, it doesn't matter how far away I am. I mean, there's no way you can make your less deflective light ever come back to the focus. That's, you know, so maybe he'll draw it here. Maybe he'll actually draw where the crossover is, because that's the real key. 200 light years away. Okay, I think he'll do it right it. here. It I think he'll form do it. An image. I think I'll do it right here. Here we go. Because the focal point is way beyond it. This is basic. This is high school. So here we go. It's high school, and so he draws the same routine convex lens. So, so I just pointed out how it's not the same lens. It won't work like that lens. It won't deflect the outside light more. High school physics there we go so see he's doing the crossover point right so he's taking here's the here's the gravitational body so he's just made the weak gravity bend the light more than the 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 strong gravity so the weak gravity the strong gravity only bent this much the weak gravity bent it that much that's not rational that can't be how the universe works it's a lie it's bullshit it's nonsense there's no crossover, there's no focus. The light can't be focused with a gravitational lens because the more you push the light this way, you just keep pushing it this way. You just keep pushing scattered light in a circle. You'll never get it to be a focus because this more bending here means that the distance between the two photons, the, the divergence between them, you're just increasing it because this one's going to bend even more than this one bends a little. You're just keep, if I kept doing it, if I kept turning the lens as it's bending, I just keep making the light further, for the photons further and further apart. I wouldn't be focusing them, I'd be doing exactly the opposite. I'd be spreading them. Projecting images are needing to be, you know, here we go. So there's the crossover. Here's the crossover. So he says in this gravitational equation, he'll be able to take this thin gravity and make that photon cross the photons in this area. So a photon coming close to the gravity, that this photon out here will eventually cross it. That'll never happen. You're wrong and fuck you. Why well, do you get things in focus? It's unfocusable within this, this entire region. And, and they get no image of... They get a ton of images, so don't, let's not lie. There's some detail in the lensing images, so you know, just keep lying some more. You can almost see galaxies in some of the images. You can see the spiral arms. Something far behind. But at a point, dependent on the angle that is of deflection, and this can be fractions of a degrees... Yes, the point is, is the one on the outside has to be more degrees. It has to be more degrees. It has to be more degrees. You have to be undoing the divergence of the light. That's the whole point of a telescope and all that stuff. It's undoing divergence. It's reversing the divergence. That a gravity lens can't undo the divergence. It's, it's configured wrong. The only way you can make a gravity lens is to take two things with strong gravity next to each other, I don't know, and then shoot the light between them because then the gravity will get stronger as you go out.
So you might be able to make a gravitational lens with two objects that are highly gravitational, fairly close to each other. But then we're talking about a slit, aren't we? <laughs> That's a point. It does form an image. And you only see the image here on Earth when we are at an appropriate distance to the right objects. Yes, well, uh, duh, but again, you, you haven't undone my argument. There's weaker gravity where there needs to be stronger gravity for it to be a lens. It's not a lens, it's whatever the fuck this is, and that will not be something good for looking through. I've explained all this before. And yeah, fuck you, you arrogant cunt. I mean, fuck you. I don't need it explained to me, okay? You're going to make an argument claiming you're smarter than somebody or you have the truth then be right. Don't be wrong. You have no right to be wrong. Not this fucking wrong and this fucking arrogant. So on both these subjects, you fucking goddamn screwed the pooch royally. So when are you going to get out of the business of uh, being a, a pompous motherfucking cunt? Don't to the trouble of drawing it out and being perhaps so explicit. But if Mendo needs to, to answer the question, what does this equation mean to him? It means nothing to me regarding a fucking photon. It's, it's, you're an idiot if you're applying it to photons, electrons, or protons. You're a fucking idiot. This is a force equation. They are the force. They are the things that make force felt. You can't apply the equation to them. You can only f apply the equation to the more complex compound of matter. It's a matter formula, not an, an electron, proton, or quanton formula. And who? You see, he started off with um, a Lesage gravity. I didn't start off with that. No, I didn't, jackass. So that's the joke here. I never even heard of Lesage gravity. So I didn't start off with it. Some other asshole said, oh, well, that's just Lesage gravity, you asshole. That's been debunked forever. And so then I had to look it up, and I said, well, yeah, it's sort of like what I'm saying. And so I defended it, because I'm saying, why the fuck doesn't it work? And uh, then I saw Feynman's silly critique, and I said, what, this is all they got? This is their big objection? Fucking raindrops? Physicists talking about raindrops? Where the force was proportional to R squared also. But that was when he was considering bodies. When he started to claim that all these bodies were made up of these single particles and only acted in this very simplistic manner, he actually lost Lesage theory. Lesage theory doesn't even fit this. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I've obviously fixed Lesage theory. So the fact that you can't understand that the kinetic thing is what makes it fixes all the things that were broken about Lesage, you dumb cunt. Man, you are just so fucking stupid, so fucking dirty, stinking petty. So he has to account for these two formulas. No, I don't have to. Not not on the quantum level, I don't. He has no... These two formulas don't exist in his scammer. Yes, because my scammer is, is that... For electrons and protons are channeling force. That's how they can hold it. They absorb force, and then they can release force. But they absorb it by holding it between them. They're shooting it at each other. That's what I keep drawing the square box for, you dumb cunt. That's why the perpendicular thing is so fucking important, because it creates a box, you dumb ass. And I don't know if you can think about this. It might be over your fucking head. But a box is kind of like a circle in the sense that somebody could stay in there forever. If there's no friction. It could just get stuck. Get stuck. Get stuck. Get stuck. I probably said that about, I don't know, 642 times. Cunt. If he says they do, let him show that they do. <coughs> Under his principles. Believe yeah, well, I already have shown that they do. And again, I'm not, there's no mass equation here, quite obviously. And acceleration, again, is a misnomer in the terms of electrons because the minute it accelerates, the field energy is going to shave off that acceleration. 
they can't really stay misformed. An electron can't maintain velocity because any irregularity in its shape is going to get shaved off by the incessant field energy. It's not allowed to go unround very long. Dumbass. Okay, so I mean, what an obnoxious piece of goddamn pig shit. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, so this is important, though. I mean, I you know I didn't realize it. I'm not you know, but look, I didn't go to physics school either. I mean, I didn't go to cosmi cosmology. U. I mean, some one of these jackasses should have figured this out. That stupid Tyson, that arrogant cunt, he should have figured this out. You can't talk about gravitational lensing the same way. It's not diffracting the light. You need a thicker gravity on the outside for it to work. Dumbasses.